I've entitled my thoughts this morning, The Dread of Gethsemane, and our study, our focus today will be taken from a combination of the four gospel accounts. We made the comment recently that these gospel accounts don't contradict each other, but they complement each other, and you get a more full picture of everything that happened as you take these various accounts and you add them together. It's kind of like puzzle pieces where you have a piece of the puzzle in Matthew and another piece in Mark, another piece in Luke, and then finally, as we come to the close of today's message, we'll look at some events that happened at the close of Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane from John's Gospel account. As we draw one week closer to the day that we know as Easter Sunday, we continue our series on the events immediately before and during and after the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. I hope that you've enjoyed the series thus far. Our first message, message one of this series, dealt with the fact that Jesus came into the world at an appointed time, to die in a, at an appointed time, in an appointed way, for an appointed people. God ordained Christ coming into the world, as we emphasize from Scripture. There's no doubt about that. It wasn't some sort of a last-ditch effort, but he came into this world with purpose. He was named on purpose, and everything about his life being spelled out in advance, even his name means salvation, Savior. Jesus came into this world to do the work that the Father had given him to do, and that was to save people that were given to the Son before the foundation of the world. Last week, message two of this series was a bit of a whirlwind, and I told you up front that we were going to give you a lot more information than we usually do in a message, but we did that on purpose. I wanted to emphasize for you how many things the Lord Jesus did on that final evening prior to his arrest, his three trials, and his eventual crucifixion. If there was anything that or any word that could describe all that Jesus did, it would be the word busyness. He was so very busy, and as he was there with his disciples, you just saw how he was more concerned with their well-being and their mental state, to use a modern term, than he was even what he was about to experience. Now, today, today in our time together, we're going to look at the Garden of Gethsemane, and we're going to see what Jesus was experiencing, all the dread and the mental anguish, knowing what was about to befall him. Again, an appointed hour, it was no mystery to him what he was about to experience. He knew this bitter cup that he was about to drink of. And today, as we look at the Garden of Gethsemane, we've entitled this message, again, The Dread of Gethsemane. We're going to look at his mind, his thoughts, all the, for lack of a better term, anxiety. The biblical term is sorrow, the dread that he would experience knowing everything that was about to befall him. Well, today our message is one in which, compared to last week, is one in which we slow down. Last week we look at one event after another event after another event, and yet today we'll, we'll not, though we'll turn to all four gospel accounts, we'll not give you multiple stories. But we'll slow down and look at all of the expressions of dread and the, the great burden that had been his to bear, the, the realization that his 33 and a half years on this world would soon be culminated in this event of the cross. And everything that he had foretold them that he would experience, everything that the eternal Son of God, the second person of the Godhead, covenanted with his Father to do upon the cross would all come to its moment of fulfillment. And so we'll slow down and we'll consider that in a greater depth today. Now, another thought as we approach unto this, this is the message out of all four of these that I want to deliver that caused me the most concern beforehand, for lack of a better term. There's language that we consider today that will make us uncomfortable. There is tension in today's message. And as such, 
we might be tempted to explain away some of the language that Jesus would say. We might be tempted to try to work around it or maybe to lessen its significance. But I think the point in God giving this to us in the gospel accounts is to make us uncomfortable. By the way, if you read the Word of God and you are not made to be uncomfortable, unless your name's Jesus, something is wrong. Because there are things in God's Word that causes us to marvel. There are things in God's Word that causes us to fear. And this is intentional. Today's message is one that the material ought to cause us to feel tension inside, to be uncomfortable. And that's okay. I want us to experience that together as we look at the words of Christ as he finally retreats. That's not the right word. Retreat is what you do when you go on a vacation somewhere, and that's the sense in which I use it, not the sense in which a military goes somewhere. I just came back from a little bit of a retreat, as it were. He departs alone in solitude, maybe would be a better way to say that. And he, for the first time reveals everything in his mind and heart to those few people who were there with him. And as you'll see, they actually fall asleep. They don't sit there and watch, as he says, and pray in an all-night vigil with him. But he, for the first time, depicts in a very graphic way the mental anguish that he's experiencing knowing what he's about to go through. Sometimes we present this in such a way, and, and it's true. He set his face as a flint. But I don't want you to think for a moment that he was some sort of superhero that did not experience pain, that didn't experience mental agony, that didn't experience sorrow or grief, particularly surrounding the moment that he would experience in the next day. No, no. Jesus was made a little lower than the angels for the purpose of suffering death for his people. Don't think that he's some sort of a comic book superhero that does not experience what any other human being would experience in terms of pain and grief in this moment. But Jesus experiences it all because he came to represent you upon the cross of Calvary. He was a man as much as he was God incarnate. And as a man, he experienced every single time the pain of being punched in the face, the hair of his beard plucked out, the impact of the scourge upon his back, the embarrassment and shame of carrying a cross through a horde of people mocking him, being nailed to a cross, Stripped of his clothing, the shame of humanity before all as he was made to be the sin bearer. And yet he endured the shame, despising it for the joy that was set before him. There was shame there and he experienced it. He endured it. He tasted death. He knows what it feels like to die. Every single emotion, with the exception of sin, or perhaps I should say every emotion without the sin that we all have guiding our emotional state, every single emotion that a person would have experienced in that moment, he experiences. And as we see in the Garden of Gethsemane, this includes a great sense of dread, horror at what was about to befall him for the sins of his people. Now, he was tempted in all points like as are we yet without sin. He had no sin. No guile was found in his mouth. As we emphasized last week from the bread that Jesus broke and distributed among the disciples, what type of bread was it? It was unleavened bread. What is leaven in Scripture so many times? A picture of sin. Jesus has no sin at all, but he would suffer as if he had lived your life and my life, as if he had committed all the sins that I've committed and you've committed and every child of God in the history of creation had committed. 
Because God is a just God. God's justice demanded someone suffer for sin, that we might be able to stand before him in glory. And so because of that, the sin bearer, Christ Jesus, comes into the world. He would feel the full weight of the sins of his people. You and I can't understand. You and I can't understand, but we've all tasted the dread of something that we know is looming, and you know what that feels like in the pit of your stomach. Magnify that, times that by infinity, as the God-man finds himself the night before he would be made the offering for sin. Before he that knew no sin was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You can imagine the dread that he experienced as a man. Remember that he is not only virally God, but he's also virally man. And so as a man, he experiences all of this. At minimum, this should make us think. Properly, it should make us uncomfortable. Beyond that, it should make us emotional. To know what Christ experienced in his mind before that dreadful hour. I hope that you spend the next seven days thinking about what we talk about here today. First thing we want to do is come to the garden. Jesus comes to the garden. At the close of last week's message, we observed Jesus' institution of communion, the Lord's Supper. We observed as they sang a hymn and they went out. This hymn is likely the Hallel, which is a collection of psalms between Psalm 113 and Psalm 118. If you notice, over the past two messages, we've concluded with a reading of the end of Psalm 118, and we begin our We conclude our song service and begin the message portion of our worship service each Lord Day with a reading from a portion of the Hallel. Today was the shortest of those, which was an expression of praise, but they sing that portion of the Psalms, it's believed, and then they depart, they go out. Before they depart, you notice from last week's message, Jesus foretells them that in just a few hours, every single one of them would forsake him and run away. If there's one thing that studying the time of the crucifixion will do, it will be to strip away all braggadocious self-righteousness that you and I are somehow better than those men. One of the most popular teachings in conservative evangelicalism among those that believe in the doctrines of grace is that of lordship salvation. Talk about it a lot here. Try not to let it become a hobby horse. But that doctrine teaches that, you know, if you're really born again, things like that really don't plague you. And I just look at Peter and James and John. And all of these men deny the Lord at his darkest hour. And it just tells me that if these men could do that, what does that say about me? Let me tell you, I'm not a Peter or a James or a John. No, I can sympathize with Peter for putting his foot in his mouth. No amens. John, at times when he says, Lord, are you going to call down fire on these people? Well, there are times that I might think that as well. But I'm not a Peter or a James or a John, and yet these men forsook him and ran away. Jesus predicts that as it would come to pass, as we'll see before the close of today's message, and he departs out into the garden. As far as the recording of this, the record of this, we'll... Turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 26. We'll look at this and passages from this Gethsemane account. We'll look first at Matthew, and then Mark, and then Luke, and then lastly, John. And I didn't do that on purpose, but it's kind of amazing how the Lord, I believe, led my mind as as I studied through that and thought about that in preparation for today. First of all, in Matthew, chapter 26, and verse 36, Then cometh Jesus with them into a place, unto a place called Gethsemane. And he saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray a yonder. And you'll notice in the other gospel accounts that he will tell them to watch and pray, that you enter not into temptation. In other words, this is a trial. It's a trial that Jesus would pass. 
It's a trial that the disciples would fail because they couldn't watch and pray. They fall asleep. They're tired. And we could beat them up about it, but if you've ever sat in the dark in comfort all night in attempt to pray, you probably fell asleep as well. So I could be critical of them and I could insult them and cast shade, maybe it would be a modern way to say it at them, but I would have fallen asleep too. How many times do you fall asleep at the end of the day praying, trying to get to the end of a prayer because you remember before you fall asleep, I haven't prayed. And so you begin to pray and the next thing you know, you wake up the next morning. I used to discourage that, but now I encourage it. What better of a way for you to fall asleep than talking to God? But these men fall asleep praying. Sit here, watch, pray while I go to pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. These are James and John. Now, we notice these men often as the inner circle of the Lord Jesus' disciples. These men, Peter, James, and John, are the men that are with him at the more crucial moments of his ministry. They were with him on the Mount of Transfiguration as Jesus is transfigured before them. And guess what they did at that moment, too? They fell asleep. Now, these are busy men. Okay, there are times, and, and we love to make jokes about it, and we pick on them about it, and they're probably in glory, like, you know, okay, no, not really, they're not really looking at us. But these men so many times labor all day and all night, all day and all night. They feed people all day, they get in a boat, they, they sail across the Sea of Galilee, storms come, they're tossed to and fro all night, they get out the next morning, and they enter onto the bank of the sea, and the next thing you know, a host of people is there again, and so they spend the next day ministering unto people. There are times they go 36, 48 hours without sleep. So you can imagine as they get somewhere and get still, you don't have cars in that day. You walk where you're going. They're exhausted. Their life was one of ministry, because that's all that Jesus did when he was here. And so they fall asleep. But these men are his most inner circle. They come into Gethsemane, and Jesus tells them, watch and pray. The word Gethsemane, interestingly enough, means a press for olive oil. The name of that place means press for olive oil. What's so interesting about that to me, and I believe that this is significant, I don't believe it's coincidental, there's another wine press, as it were, another press mentioned in Scripture, the wine press of the wrath of God. And as you see from Isaiah chapter 63, verses 1 through 3, Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This is that glorious, this is, this, that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat, I have treaded the wine press alone. Now, who is this that comes from Basra? Well, this is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has treaded the wine press of the wrath of God alone. Revelation corresponds to this. It refers to it. Jesus has alone by himself treaded the wine press of God's wrath. You couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. For you and I to tread the wine press of the wrath of God would be for you and for me to experience the wrath of God for eternity in the lake of fire. That's what God's wrath is towards our sin. And yet Jesus has treaded out the wine press of the wrath of God. I have trodden the wine press, he says, and I've done it how? Alone. I will tread them in my anger and trample them in my fury. Their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. The day of vengeance is in mine heart. Now, we love to point out the fact that God has wrath towards sin, and God's wrath towards sin for a person will be executed in one of two places. It will either be executed in the lake of fire, which burns forever, or it will be executed upon Christ Jesus upon the cross of Calvary. In one place, Christ, God, in truth, is judging. In one place, the cross, God, in truth, is judging. He judges His Son in our stead, or He judges them individually and personally for their sins. Either place, God's wrath, the winepress of it, is treaded out. Jesus treads the winepress. 
Here, it's an olive press, Gethsemane. The name means press for olive oil. And you can see rich symbolization there, even in the name meaning. Remember, this is an appointed thing. God has a hand in this. He steers, he guides, and even the name of this garden is named appropriately. Once here in the garden, Jesus is overcome with dread. Notice this from verse 38. He saith unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. In the course of this, we'll see that Jesus goes three different times and prays. And every time that he goes and he prays, the words that he says are the same. He offers this prayer three different occasions. Each of these times that he prays, he returns to the disciples and he asks them, could you not watch and pray? It's only, it's only to sit and to watch and to pray that I'm asking, could you not do this? And the last of these times he tells them, get your sleep, get your rest, you're going to need it. The hour's come. At points in this, as we'll see today, what you witness, particularly from Luke's recording of this, is amazing, and at the same time, heartbreaking. It's gut-wrenching to see Jesus in the garden becomes overcome. Three times he asks his father, listen to me, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. First of all, you might say that Jesus is absolutely horrified, for lack of a better term, at what he's about to experience. And whatever word you could think of to use, it's not strong enough. Full of dread, exceeding sorrow, horrified, whatever word you want to use, it's inadequate, and yet it's appropriate to try. Let's read just the account of it as we find it in Matthew's gospel and then make some observations. He saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. He went a little further. He goes by himself. He fell on his face and he prayed, saying, O oh, my father. In Mark's rendition of this, it's Abba, father. Well, which is it? Both. Abba, oh my father. That's the most simple and primitive of a term that a young child would say at the earliest moment of his life to his daddy. Abba, father, oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. He cometh unto the disciples, and he findeth them asleep. He saith unto Peter, What, could you not watch with me one hour? Jesus scolds them from time to time, and they deserve it every time. But there are times that he just tells them, What in the world is the matter with you? There are times when people come to have devils cast out, and he says, Oh, ye of little faith, how long will I be with you? At one point in Peter's ministry, right after Jesus commends him, who, who do you say that I am? That were the Christ, the Son of the living God. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. My Father revealed it unto you. That Jesus says, I'm going to go up to Jerusalem. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to die. And I'm going to rise again. And Peter says, not so, Lord. He takes him and he begins to upbraid him. And Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. You savor not the things of God, but the things of man. Jesus at times would rebuke them. He comes to them and their weakness, not his. I want you to understand, this is not a moment of weakness for Jesus. It is a moment of sorrow, but not a moment of weakness. It is a moment of weakness for them. You see this the entire time. And I love that Jesus describes us as sheep and children, because so many times 
You know, we understand that as parents, you're the responsible one. You're the one that keeps them from running out in traffic or being taken by a stranger or ingesting poison or destroying themselves in any other number of creative ways. I like to tell the story about one of my kids that strapped themselves into a wagon with no brakes, no steering, but wearing the seatbelt, safety first. And setting off down the driveway, you know what my house looks like, it's on a hill. And so as it comes to the road, you know, with traffic, it hits the curb and flips through the air. And it's my job to keep these people from killing themselves. So many times in Jesus' ministry, that's his role in this world where these men are clueless. These are adult men. Here they are. He finds them asleep. Could you not pray and watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if this cup may pass, not away from me, except I drink it. Thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them, and he went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples, and he saith unto them, Sleep on now, and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand. And the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Again, why is Jesus experiencing this? Because of the understanding, the knowledge of the torture of the next few hours that he would endure. He's taken and he's lied about. All three trials would result in his beating. They would punch him in the face. They would slap him. They would surround him and buffet him. They would take a reed and put it in his hands, imitating the scepter of a king, and they would hit him in the head with it. They took a crown of thorns and dug them into his brow, mocking him. They put on him purple to mock him in his rightful claim to be the king. After his final trial, as Pilate sentenced him to death via crucifixion, the Romans would scourge him and mock him and beat him. Again, to emphasize the pain of scourging. So many people didn't survive the scourging itself. They take you and they strap you down. They expose your bare back and they whip you with a multi-tasseled whip with shards of bone or rock or metal at the end of each talon, digging down to the flesh, through the flesh to the bone exposing muscle and blood vessels. It was an absolutely horrific sight. Prophetically, Isaiah says that his vision, his visage was marred more than any man so that he was not recognizable as a man. Jesus knows all of that. He knows that he would have to carry a cross. He knows that he would be stripped down, nailed to a tree, and with a thud, the cross comes to a stop in a hole in the ground and He hangs there suspended between heaven and earth. And as bad as all of that is, as terrible as all of that is physically, his father would judge him in some mystery as if he had committed the very vile sins that you and I have committed throughout our entire lives. He was made to be the bearer of sin, though he knew no sin. And understanding all of that in advance, he is stricken with absolute horror and dread. I can't emphasize it enough. Now Jesus knows this and being overcome with grief, exceeding sorrow, as he says in verse 38, what does he do? He doesn't run. What does Jonah do when God says, Jonah, go preach to these enemies of Israel? Jonah goes the clear opposite direction to the ends of the known world at the time. And that was just when he was told to go preach to people he didn't want to preach to. How many times have you gone and done the exact opposite of what you know God's telling you to do? He doesn't do that. He goes somewhere alone with his closest friends. He asks them to pray for him and with him, and he goes to his father in prayer. 
there's a lesson in that that we'll emphasize at the close of today's message. Being overcome with grief, he prays. Now, I have heard creative ways to try to explain away what Jesus is saying. Now, please, to be very clear, Jesus is not running from what's going to happen. Jesus is not attempting to get out of what is about to happen, but what he is asking, Lord, Father, if there is any other way for these people to be with you in glory than for me to experience all I'm about to experience, Lord, let us pursue that way. But not as I will. I will be done. He's not asking to get out of it. He's not asking to get out of it. His face is set as a flint. He endured the cross, despising the shame for the joy set before him. But he is looking that terrible, terrible experience in the face. And as a man, and we're emphasizing his humanity here, he is God and he is man. Completely God, completely man, joined together, we call it the hypostatic union. As a man, the emotion of what he's looking in the face is on his shoulders, in his mind. I imagine you can feel it in your chest. Don't you know when when something that devastating is about to happen and there's no way that you're going to get around it and you just feel that stress in your chest? For pastors, we generally experience that before what we call karate conferences. You know, when you have a conference and you know it's going to get out of hand and people are going to start kung fu fighting? Try preaching a sermon with that in your gut. Yeah, it's difficult. Doesn't take a, doesn't hold a candle to what he's experiencing. He's so overcome here. Now, Mark's gospel is very clear in Mark chapter 14, it simply says that Jesus begs this of his father. He asks, if there's any other way for this to be resolved. He went forward a little and he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, that hour might pass from him. Now, I've heard creative ways, again, that people have tried to explain this away. Well, he was asking to get out of being separated from his father for all of eternity. Jesus was not going to be separated from his father for all of eternity. He's the second person of the Godhead. That's not possible. Well, he was agreeing to remain dead forever. That's not possible. He's declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection. He's not asking to be let out of some hypothetical and God heard him and let him out of the hypothetical. I've heard creative attempts to explain his words away. Listen, don't do that. Simply look this tension in the face and accept it. Prior to this terrible, hideous suffering, Jesus, as a man, says, Lord, Father, if there be any other way, but not as I will. You have to take the latter part of that statement to clarify the first part of that statement. He's not asking to get out of it. He's asking if there's any other way. Was there any other way? No. There was no other way. There was no other way. We'll give you a point on that in a moment. Mark 14.35 is explicit. He fell and he prayed, if it were possible, that the hour might pass from him. The hour did not pass from him. It was not possible. That's there for a reason. You need to know, you need to know there is no other way. As we emphasize the agony of Jesus upon the cross, I, I want to turn over to the book of Luke chapter 22. As I told you, we'll go Matthew, then Mark, then Luke, and then lastly John. To emphasize the severity of his emotional distress at this hour, 
Luke 22, verses 43 and 44, you can back up just a little bit and get Luke giving us the setting. He came out, and as he went, he was wont to the Mount of Olives. His disciples went with him. When he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. He was withdrawn about a stone's cast. That gives you a little more information. How far did he go from the apostles? He went about a stone's throw. A stone's throw. How far is that? Depends on who's throwing the stone. (laughs) But it's a figure of speech. He goes a stone's throw. He falls down, he kneels down, and he says, Father, if if thy be willing, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. What a marvel is that. Angels appear twice in his ministry to strengthen him. One, after his temptation in the wilderness following his baptism. As you know, he fasts 40 days. Satan comes to him and tempts him. By the uh, the way, that word tempt there does not mean that Jesus lusted after what Satan tempted him with. So when we say, I'm tempted to do something, what we mean many times is, I'm lusting after that, and I'm trying to put that to death. And sometimes we do, and sometimes we don't. Jesus was tempted in all points like as are we, yet without sin. That means Satan solicits him. The word tempt many times means solicit with sin. In other words, Satan comes to him and he says, oh, look at this. This is something that you need, like a street peddler in Aladdin. You know what I'm saying? I'm kind of channeling that right now. You know, And every single time Jesus says, no. And he does it by quoting scripture. How might we endure temptation? Number one, with scripture, what does Jesus do here? He prays. Number two, how might we deal with temptation? We pray. Jesus is being solicited here. And what happens? An angel appears to strengthen him. Now, does the second person of the Godhead need strengthening? No. Much of what we're seeing is Jesus in his humanity. And you say, well, I don't understand what you mean, that there are times when it's his divinity and times when it's his humanity, and yet it's all the same all the time in every way. Well, to quote Paul, what am I going to say? Great is the mystery of godliness. You and I can't understand it. This is the second person of the Godhead being incarnate as a man. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Godliness there doesn't have reference to us being godly people. It has reference to God being manifest in human flesh. No, we can't understand it. There are times when he hungers and thirsts, and yet God cannot hunger. And there are times when he's transfigured, and it's obvious that you're seeing his deity, his divinity. This is a mystery, a great mystery. In his humanity, an angel strengthens him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Listen. And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Now this also goes under the category of things that sometimes we like to explain away because it makes us uncomfortable. And the reason that we in particular like to try to say, well, this really wasn't blood, it was just sweating as if he were bleeding, is because a hundred something years ago, some crazy idea was introduced among our people that this is when Jesus shed his blood in redemption. Jesus did not shed his blood in redemption in Gethsemane. Redemption was not in Gethsemane, but Calvary. There is a hymn in our hymnal that doesn't belong there entitled Gethsemane. Please don't call it out after the service. If you were thinking it, please don't call it out after the service. That puts redemption in Gethsemane. How do I know what hymn that is? It's entitled Gethsemane. If you change it to Calvary, it's a great hymn. 
Jesus does not shed his blood in a redemptive way here, but Jesus sweat, as it were, great drops of blood here. We don't have to damage what happens to explain away a passage because somebody, some heretic, created a heresy out of it. But he does sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. So he sweats blood, but this isn't redemptive shedding of blood. The shedding of blood is when one's blood is shed in death. And that would happen where? As Jesus died upon the cross. But to sweat blood is something that is called hematohydrosis, hematohydrosis. I don't know how to pronounce that. Maybe one of those two was right. Maybe neither of them were right. You know, you hear you, you both can't be right, but they can both be wrong. This is a bleeding disorder, but it may also occur in individuals, and I quote, suffering from extreme levels of stress. Around the sweat glands, there are multiple blood vessels in a net-like form which constrict under the pressure of great stress per NIH.gov. And so Jesus is enduring such stress and agony that his blood vessels constrict and blood comes from his pores as he sweats. No one in the history of the world has ever suffered like Jesus Christ suffered. And this is not even when he suffered for sin. This is what he sees, what he experiences in light of what he will suffer. To be clear, and again, this is not redemptive shedding of blood, but he sweats as it were great drops of blood. I see no reason to explain that away. Luke includes that for a reason. Now, looking through the lens of history and science and medicine, we know that this is what happens when a person is under the greatest stress that human beings can be under. I could not begin to imagine, and neither could you, but that's why we have it written. And I hope it makes us uncomfortable to think about. I hope it makes us marvel that Christ would be in such an emotional state prior to his suffering. A last word on that from the book of Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8. And this refers again to his humanity. Though he were a son which tells us that Son of God communicates deity and divinity. He learned obedience, learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. In being made perfect, which means fulfilled, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, which is the statement number one of assurance, but understand that every single layer of promise obeys him from death and sin to life in Christ, as he calls their dead soul from death, to life. There's a sense in which we've all obeyed if we're a regenerated person because like Lazarus, he says, come forth and live and we come to life. But this statement is one of assurance to you. Are you one that seeks to obey him? The reason that you do is because he has become the captain, the author of your salvation. And if he's the author of it, he'll be the finisher of it. As Hebrews chapter 12 says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Mystery of mysteries. The second person of the Godhead, which has all omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence, incarnate as a man, learned. He learned to walk. He learned to crawl before he learned to walk. He learned to speak. He learned the word of God through study in his human mind, though he authored it through divine inspiration. Mystery of godliness. He was a human being in body, soul, and spirit like every single one of you. He was necessary so that he could save you because he had to be one of you. And here in Hebrews, he learned obedience. 
I sat at a lunch table 14 years ago with preachers trying to get to the bottom of that. What does that mean? He learned. He knows everything in his humanity. He learned obedience. Think about this. God the Son never had to obey God the Father in eternity past. They're always in perfect unison and harmony as the triune God. And yet incarnate is God the Son. He learns obedience by the things that he what? That he suffered. You see that at play in the Garden of Gethsemane through the time when he gives up the ghost upon the cross. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He's obeying the Father. He is obeying the Father. You see also here in the Garden, and we won't emphasize this any more than we already have, the weakness of the flesh of the disciples. He says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He's not referring to his flesh. He's referring to the disciples. So many times your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. They're willing, they're there, they try to pray, but what happens? They fall asleep. The moral of the story for the followers of Jesus, you know, churches love impressive slogans. How's that one? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Put that on the sign in our marketing campaign. What, what epitomizes Flint River? The spirit's willing and the flesh is weak. But we've got a great God. <laughs> Number two, emphasizing their weakness, Luke, uh, Mark 14, 37, the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. Mark, 10, uh, Mark 14, 50, Mark 14, 50, all the disciples fled. They ran away. Now, a final word on Jesus in the garden before we look at briefly his arrest. Because there's a point that I want to make out of his arrest. Every time Jesus prays, he ends his prayer with what? Not my will, but thine. Jesus is completely resolved to do exactly what the Father had given him to do. Lord, if there be any other way, but if this is thy will, that the cup won't pass until I drink it, I will be done, I will drink of the cup. I will drink of this bitter cup of the wrath of God. In every way, he is completely submissive to his Father's will. He learns obedience through the things that he suffered. What a mystery is that? Don't explain away the mysteries because we can't understand them. Those are the things in which he's glorified the most. Those are the things that cause his people to marvel at him. If you can't get through this message without marveling, go listen to it again. Go read the passages again. It's intentional. Now we come to John, chapter 18. It's one of my favorite passages in the Bible to preach. Since we've preached it many times, it's what we'll say the least amount of words about today. In John chapter 18, verse 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went over forth with his disciples over the brook Cedron, where was a garden, into the which when he entered, uh, he entered and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus often resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? Now, in the process of this happening, Judas comes to him in Luke chapter 22, in verses 47 and 48, and what does Judas do? He betrays him, how? With a kiss. What does the proverb say? Deceitful are the kisses of an enemy, but faithful are the wounds of a friend. If a friend tells you you've done wrong, that's better to you than when an enemy flatters you. And as we see with Jesus, this literally, literally comes to pass. Je Judas comes up to Jesus. He betrays him with a kiss. Jesus asks these men that come to him with lanterns and torches, Whom seek ye? They say, Jesus of Nazareth. Look at verse 5 of John chapter 18. Jesus 
saith unto them, I am he. Now, we use the KJV here, and the version, I'm, the translation I'm reading from, you notice that the word he is in italics. The KJV translators have enough integrity to tell you when they translate a word, or when they include a word, rather, that was not in the original Greek. It's implied, it's implied, but it's not in the original language. And so, what then are Jesus' literal words to these men that come to arrest him? I am. am. Why do those words make the hair on the back of your neck stand up right now? Because those are the words of the divine title when Moses stood before the bush that burned but was not consumed, when he says, when the children of Israel ask the name of the God that sent me unto them, To set them free, what will I tell them? Tell them, I am hath sent thee. I am that I am. When these men come to arrest Jesus, his literal words to them are none other than the divine title, I am. He said those words one other time in his ministry in such a way, and the Jews sought to kill him when he said, before Abraham was, I am. Never let anybody tell you Jesus never claimed to be God incarnate. When Jesus says this, what happens? Oh, I love this. As soon as he had said that unto them, I am, they went backwards and fell to the ground. Jesus says, I am. They don't fall forward. They don't fall to the side. They don't take a step back because, oh, goodness, that's him. They fall backwards. Why? Because God incarnate just pronounced his divinity to them. He claims who he is. And as sinful, weak men, rather than taking up stones to stone him, as they so many times did, they fall backwards at the simple pronunciation of his deity. Because in his word, in his voice, is power. How did God create the universe? He merely spoke it into being. How will He raise the dead at the end of time? He'll merely speak. How did He save you from death and sin to life in Christ? By the voice of the Son of God. You heard and you lived. John chapter 5. How did He resurrect Lazarus? Lazarus come forth. All He has to do but speak, is but speak. And His enemies fall on their backs. In the book of Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 7, we read in, that Jesus is like a lamb dumb before the shearers, opening not his mouth. And through the entire process of his trials, his words were very few. Thou sayest, when they ask, are you the Christ? At times they would Be outraged as he says things such as, you'll see me descend from heaven. You'll see me in glory with the angels. And they begin to cry blasphemy at him. But his words were few. Why is that? Why did he have to go as a lamb dumb before the shears, speechless like a lamb being sheared? Because had Jesus pronounced who he was to them, Jesus could have used his words as the second person of the Godhead to obliterate the universe. He could have called for legions of angels to come and fight that battle so that every human being in the world was slain and cast into hell forever. But he had come into the world for that moment. That was the appointed time. That was the appointed death. And so like a lamb dumb before the shears, opening not his mouth, he goes to that moment submitting to the brutality of men and the wrath of his father. He had to go as a lamb dumb. Now, I know that our time is over. What are our takeaways from this? First of all, Jesus epitomizes submission to the father as well as restraint. No one in the history of creation has ever submitted to God like Jesus is submitting to God right here before our eyes. Nor has anyone ever exercised that degree of restraint. 
If you come beating me up and I simply have the power in my voice to disintegrate your atoms, back at lunch. But he shows his restraint. Number two, this shows us in our takeaways that there was absolutely no other way. There was no other way than what was going to befall him. Number three, to submit to God the way we ought to submit to God requires much prayer. If Jesus prays in moments like that, you and I ought to hit our knees anytime we find adversity and every other time than that. Number four, while this was absolutely horrific, and we see that in Jesus' sorrow knowing what he's about to experience, while it's absolutely horrific, Jesus endured all of it, despising the shame for the joy of having you in heaven with him. Hebrews 12 and verse 2. How have we closed every other message in this series thus far? With a simple reading of Psalm 118. In closing, we turn to Psalm 118. Verse 21, I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me, thou art become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made. Jesus sees it approaching. And in agony and dread, he prays to his Father for strength. And he prays in submission. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for giving us your inspired word, recording for us these heart-rending accounts of your son and the agony he experienced of grief and dread and horror in the Garden of Gethsemane, we can't understand it. We dare not explain it away. We do marvel at it. We thank you, Father, that his prayer was not, Lord, stop this from happening, but Lord, thy will be done. Because the only hope that we have to see you and not to be exiled from you for all of eternity is through that offering that he would make the following day upon the cross of Calvary as he was crucified as he who knew no sin was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. May we spend the rest of our days and the rest of eternity worshiping and praise him who is worthy. We say this in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God from